Okay, okay. <laughs> Cough to the mic. Oops. Oops. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the last colloquium of the semester. It happened. Um, so um, today is the second lecture delivered by um, Glenda Gilmore on Romare Bearden, A Life in Art. Um, yesterday's lecture, the first in the Huggins Lecture Series, was wonderful, so please do come again at 4 p.m. And next week, we'll have another three-parter lecture series entitled Exiting Slavery, Entry and Reconstruction, and Enduring Jim Crow, and these will be delivered by Earl Lewis. Now, please welcome to the podium Nicole Dutton. She's the managing editor of Transition and the Du Bois Review magazines. Hello, it is my great pleasure to, and honor to introduce Jabari Asim today here at the Fellows Colloquium. Jabari is an associate professor at Emerson College where he directs the graduate program in creative writing. Jabari is a restless, deeply curious and prolific writer of nonfiction and short stories and novels and plays and poetry and children's literature. Although the range of his work is broad, I'd say that Jabari's specialty is counter-narrative. His works are gorgeously disruptive and meant to illuminate, reckon with, reclaim, record, restore, and remember African-American experience. Jabari's recent works are Only the Strong, a novel, Preaching to the Chickens, a story of young John Lewis, which is a children's book, and A Child's Introduction to African-American History, which is a reference book for children. His other books include Not Guilty, 12 Black Men Speak Out on Law, Justice, and Life, which he edited, The N-Word, Who Can Say It, Who Shouldn't, and Why, and What Obama Means for Our Culture, Our Politics, and Future. He is a frequent public speaker and commentator who has appeared on NPR's Morning Edition, The Today Show, Colbert Report, Hannity and Combs, and countless other programs. His byline has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Essence Magazine, USA Today, and the Chicago Tribune, among others. As an editor for 11 years at the Washington Post, he also wrote a syndicated column on politics, popular culture, and social issues. Professor Asim served for 10 years as the executive editor of The Crisis, the NAACP's flagship journal of politics, culture, and ideas. He has garnered many praises for his work. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a New York Times Best Illustrated Book of 2016 Award, and a Massachusetts Book Honor Award. Please join me in welcoming Jabari Asim as he reads from his book, We Can't Breathe, which will be published in October. Good afternoon. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Nicole, and thank you, uh, Hutchins Center, for inviting me to share uh, from my forthcoming book, uh, which is a collection of essays. Uh, and I'm going to read to you from one of the essays, which is called The Elements of Strut. This is an abridged version. I think it'll take us uh, maybe 40, 45 minutes. And uh, I'm hopeful that my voice will stretch out as I read. Um, it's called The Elements of Strut. In ideal circumstances, the human body flows in a state of strut, a jauntiness, an ease, a response to the rhythms that animate the earth. To strut is to reflect the graceful rotation of the planet in one's breath, in one's step, in the pace and melody of one's speech, in one's swerve and laughter. I strut, therefore, I am. Strut is the body in motion, occupying, manipulating, and moving through space. Strutting requires freedom, the liberty to flex and stretch. Lately, I have been habitually watching a short film by Andrew Margitson. His camera follows the brilliant dancer Little Buck as he floats, pops, and glides through the Foundation Louis Vuitton in Paris. Dancers are often so subtle they can't help themselves, walking with a distinctive grace that signals their talent. Little Buck, 
doesn't walk like that. He enters the museum as any ordinary mortal would. He is lithe and trim, to be sure, but with an unassuming gait that hides his kinetic genius. Then the music begins, and he leans into the air, his ankles as improbably bent as a hapless guard defending LeBron James. His voiceover narration introduces his style as a blend of hip hop and ballet. As performing artists, as dancers, he explains, we see everything as art. Up the escalator and through a light-filled space adorned with paintings, Little Buck maneuvers his undeniably dark body, pirouetting, altering time, and gently challenging gravity. He bends to the point of crumpling, only to reassemble, restoring his smooth musculature as if by magic. The beauty of the dance is a timely distraction. Little Buck moves adroitly in a space where figures like his have seldom been regarded with respect or delight. His sublime world helps me forget, however briefly, that darkness in a body complicates even the most basic stroll, reduces an inalienable right to an elusive privilege. The unbound black body is profoundly inconvenient. The dark muscles, the bones underneath, the vulnerable organs and the sheltering skin, each comprises a segment on the map of a plundered continent. Each is redolent of conquest and empire. Four centuries ago, our ancestors were marched at gunpoint across sand and savanna, far from their home villages to near death and misery in the confinement castles of the African West Coast. Those who stumbled and lost their footing never made it even that far. Inevitably, history complicates our strut. Then, as now, locomotion sometimes can require treading the slender border between life and death. Lately, headlines remind us of all the same and different ways a black body can collide with its inconvenience. Breathing, walking, waiting to cross at the light, using a golf club as a cane while crossing a Seattle intersection, heading home while carrying candy and a can of iced tea. Any of these can be seen as unforgivable trespass, alien intrusion on ground that must be defended. The wrongful arrests, the point blank executions, the gunshots to the back, the militarized police responses, the illuminating silence of white self-styled liberals, and most critical, the paucity of convictions, all point to the same existential question. How can we strut in a strange land? While my contemplation of strut respects the question of how to live in a black body, I am more interested in how to escape my own imprisoning concept of that body. I don't believe the black body has any more potential than any other kind, but I am concerned with the extent to which its capabilities are suppressed by one's own internalized limitations. Racism and its accompanying cruelties have shaped me to police myself to restrict, restrict my own movement through spaces. And by spaces, I mean both actual and metaphorical. The great resistor Carter G. Woodson warned, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. He might have added, independent thinking seldom goes undisciplined. Some black people use this fact to justify subjecting their children to corporal punishment. They contend incorrectly, I beat my son so the police won't. On any given day, how often do I manage to keep oppressive thinking out of my head? Am I ever free from an imagined white gaze? How often do I succumb to beating myself? When my wife and I visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture during its opening weekend, immense crowds made it impossible to linger before any of the exhibits. Still, it was easy to make connections between past and present, even while moving rapidly. Easy, for example, to note the painful irony of tolerating forced elbow-to-elbow -elbow intimacy with strangers in underground passageways while looking at displays about the cramped horrors of the Middle Passage. Easy to look at shackles and think of Alton Sterling, executed by police a few months earlier while bound and subdued in Baton Rouge. Or Kajim Powell, after killing the mentally disturbed man, St. Louis police officers rolled his corpse over 
and cuffed his inert wrists behind his lifeless back, as if mocking that whole freedom and death thing. Similarly, it was hard to look at images of Africans chained in the holds of storm-tossed storm trading vessels and not think of Freddie Gray, shackled in the back of a speeding Baltimore police van on a rough ride to his death. Hard to avoid the unsightly realization that rusted iron manacles from the mid-1800s, forced specifically to hold a black body in place, still look sturdy enough to do the job. A century before those shackles were forged, a colonial landowner named George Washington was also obsessed with policing the mobility of his enslaved. In Henry Wingcheck's book, An Imperfect God, the historian writes that the man who would become president created a new problem he called night walking, men and women going out at night to visit family members. A man named Boson, who was twice caught running away in 1760, may actually have been night walking to visit his lover when he was caught. Yet do I marvel at the complexity of such a strut, the strategy and fortitude employed in traveling great distances, avoiding patty rollers under cover of darkness, indulging hurried kisses and urgent embraces before rushing back to begin the day's drudgery. Washington was long dead by 1849 when Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger B. Taney weighed in on the intricacies of strut. In his dissent in the passenger cases, he wrote, we are all citizens of the United States, and as members of the same community, must have the right to pass and repass through every part of it without interruption, as freely as in our own states. Eight years later, in Dred Scott v. Sanford, Chief Justice Taney would explain exactly whom he meant by we. Their debasement reaffirmed by Taney's court both the enslaved and those tethered by subtler bonds continue to rely on culture for solace and even transcendence, however brief. In jubas, ring shouts, and cakewalks, black bodies turned and pranced with rhythm, delicacy, and commitment, as if they could strut all the way to Africa, or failing that, a territory where slavery had been banned. As they stepped and whirled through war and its aftermath, as the contours of their collective strut distorted and bent under the ignorant gaze of their captors, as movements that began as parody became subjects of parody themselves, their motions must have acquired a melancholy knowingness. Yet they pressed on, dipping, wheeling, and risking delight. With the Southern Rebellion ostensibly resolved in their favor, the newly emancipated were no doubt inclined to waltz directly from the fields and quarters to the beckoning world, the post-bellum precursor to dancing in the streets. But in their initial jubilation, they struggled to withstand a new reality in which they stood unshackled but remained unfree. That condition was already familiar to those who had earlier slipped through the cracks the rebellion had created. Desperate and with few friends or resources, they followed the conquering footsteps of the Union Army. Neither soldier nor fugitive speaks with so deep a meaning as that dark human cloud that clung like remorse on the rear of those swift columns, swelling at times to half their size, almost engulfing and choking them, Du Bois wrote in The Souls of Black Folk. In vain were they ordered back. In vain were bridges hewn from beneath their feet. On they trudged and writhed and surged until they rolled into Savannah, a starved and naked horde of tens of thousands. Blackness to a ragged thinness beat shines nonetheless. In the midst of filth and misery, the refugees shared sustenance and intelligence, forming new alliances of bond and blood. They made a way out of no way, just as their ancestors had done in the sweltering bellies of Jesus, Amistad, Henrietta Marie, and the other vessels that had dragged them, battered and tormented, to the looming horrors of a strange new hell. Sometimes I picture in my mind a crimson thread originating in Africa, unspooling alongside a young boy, stumbling and choking as his coffle yanks him toward the sea. The thread extends apparently without end through the bloody spill of centuries and across fruited plains and fetid plantations, trailing the double-time stomp of a black Union soldier 
and continuing to unspool beside the swollen ankles of a church matron marching her way from Selma to Montgomery. I could see the thread snaking along Pennsylvania Avenue during Barack and Michelle Obama's stately walk to the White House. It's a spirit-lifting fantasy of black endurance and triumph, a useful antidote for the weary blues. I imagine the black refugees that Du Bois wrote about might have been similarly revived by the sight of dark-skinned soldiers garbed in Union blue, counting off cadences while picking them up and putting them down. Just such a scene unfolds in Glory, the Oscar-winning 1989 film about the mostly black 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. A group of black children scurry across a yard and line up at a picket fence to gape and grin at the regiment as they proceed down a southern lane, rifles poised on their shoulders. With fifes and drums providing accompaniment, Morgan Freeman, portraying Sergeant Major John Rawlins, pauses to smile kindly at the children. That's right, he tells them, ain't no dream. We run away slaves, but we come back fighting men. The children, bathed in a sepia glow, stare in awe at the soldiers' receding ranks. In the background, a choir sings soaring angelic notes. By the end of the rebellion, nearly 200,000 black men had helped defend the republic against the Confederate traitors. At the same time, black women like Harriet Tubman engaged in a stealthier strut, risking their lives to assist the war effort by gathering intelligence behind enemy lines. While their deeds were inspiring to their fellow black people, most whites had quite a different reaction. For them, the notion of armed, marching Negroes was the stomach-churning stuff of nightmares. Instead of Du Bois's starved and naked horde, they saw a weaponized and rapacious swarm, lockstep and bodacious strut. After a brief flirtation with genuine reform, the Union rushed to reconcile with its former enemy, easily finding common ground and a seductive compulsion to confine the black body to its proper place, geographical, social, and metaphorical. The black strut developed a dispiriting pattern, two steps forward, one step back. After the Hayes-Tilden Compromise killed Reconstruction in 1877, the white American obsession with breaking people and things found release in the form of ritualized murders that involved torture, mutilation, burning, and communal immersion in a ceremony of sexual and religious fervor. Lynchings, as they came to be known, were a national pastime, like county fairs, Sunday school, and spectator sports. They continued in their principal form well into the 1950s, with occasional outbreaks occurring even now. The Equal Justice Initiative's recent comprehensive study found evidence of 4,075 lynchings of African Americans in the South between 1877 and 1950. That figure doesn't include the murders of Emmett Till in 1955 and James Byrd Jr. in 1998, to say nothing of the numberless killings that took place above the Mason-Dixon line during the same period. Perversely democratic, these blood rites claimed a variety of sacrificial victims, including children, expectant mothers, and fetuses ripped from wombs and nailed to trees. Not surprisingly, soldiers in uniform, whose sheer effrontery provoked such irrational horror, were often favorite targets. While many lynchings focused on one or a small number of victims, the compulsion occasionally erupted with such orgiastic excess that it engulfed entire communities. The East St. Louis Massacre of 1917 provides an appalling example. The factory town on the border between Illinois and Missouri had become contested ground after nearly 12,000 blacks migrated there from the violent, unrepentant South. Conflicts between white workers and black newcomers blew up on July 2nd. A group of black people, fearing for their lives and standing their ground, returned fire at a car carrying two white men. The men were police officers, and both died instantly. Soon a mob of whites rampaged through the city, focusing their rage on Black Valley, the African-American community. Carlos Hurd, a reporter with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, published a chilling eyewitness account of small, leaderless groups moving with horribly cool deliberateness and a spirit of fun, 
as they set about destroying the life of every discoverable black man. Their methods included stoning, bludgeoning, shooting, hanging, and burning victims alive. The sheds in the rear of Negroes' houses, which were themselves in the rear of the main buildings on 4th Street, had been ignited to drive out the Negro occupants of the houses, Heard wrote, and the slayers were waiting for them to come out. It was stay in and be roasted, or come out and be slaughtered. A moment before I arrived, one Negro had taken the desperate chance of coming out, and the rattle of revolver shots, which I heard as I approached the corner, was followed by the cry, they've got him. Official reports listed 39 dead black people, but others put the number much higher. The St. Louis Globe Democrats banner headline declared 100 Negroes shot, burned, clubbed to death in East St. Louis race war. 6,000 black residents fled, rushing headlong over the two bridges stretching across the Mississippi River and into St. Louis. The bloodbath drew the condemnation of many black activists, including Marcus Garvey. The head of the United Negro Improvement Association spoke passionately at a public forum in New York. I can hardly see why black men should be debarred from going where they choose in the land of their birth, he said. To go where one chooses was certainly an animating impulse for African Americans who abandoned places like Louisiana and Mississippi for towns like East St. Louis, lured by fantastic tales told by relatives, the inventive lobbying of Pullman porters, and the promise of employers offering higher wages than a sharecropper ever dreamed of. But the Great Migration, its own kind of epic strut, was not without dead ends and hard reversals. Ida B. Wells told the Chicago Herald that the labor unions of the North and the planters of the South were working together, together using murder, arson, and intimidation to drive the Negro back where he came from. Two steps forward, one step back. Like Wells, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People also pressed for congressional action, including an anti-lynching bill. In addition, on July 28, 1917, it staged the largest civic demonstration of its kind ever held before in the United States, a breakthrough display of collective strut. 10,000 strong, black people marched along New York City's Fifth Avenue in a parade of protests. Men dressed in dark suits and straw boaters, women and children in white. Their expressions solemn and unyielding, they blazed a trail through public space, raising banners that announced their outright dissatisfaction. Mr. President, why not make America safe for democracy? Mother, do lynchers go to heaven? Your hands are full of blood. Unlike the iconic mid-century marches that would follow, multiracial assemblies in which the heartfelt harmonizing of spirituals, civil rights anthems, and folk tunes provided a rousing chorus, not a song was sung. With the East St. Louis butchery still so fresh that they could almost taste the ash, the marchers stepped resolutely across New York City and never said a mumbling word. The only sound was muffled drums. In choosing an instrument denied black people during their captivity, the NAACP was perhaps indulging in a bit of spiritual reclamation. The slaveholders' fear of drums bordered on superstition. They believed them capable of stirring up frenzy so contagious and fast spreading that it was nearly impossible to resist. Ironically, their suspicions were confirmed in the early 20th century when jazz became a national fascination. Like lynching, it frequently brought whites together to entertain appetites often scorned in polite society. Then, as now, whites' interaction with African Americans and their culture reflected a perplexing conjunction of lust and disdain. Many white East St. Louisans, for example, may very well have been in their parlors listening with rapt attention to a recording of Darktown Strutter's Ball before going out to mutilate and murder their neighbors in nearby Black Valley. Released less than two months before the massacre, the original Dixieland Jazz Band's rendition of the song quickly ruled the airwaves. Written by black composer Shelton Brooks, the tune interests me because it was among the first to introduce the black strut to a mass mainstream audience. An all-white combo, the originals made their name, as it were, 
copying the black music developed in and around the Storyville district of New Orleans. A 1917 record cover proclaims them the creators of jazz. The area's most notable native son was Louis Armstrong, who strutting with some barbecue, along with dozens of his other tunes, also became a jazz standard. My favorite of his many versions was recorded in 1953, 15 years after Joe Lewis made mince meat out of Max Schmeling, 12 years after Navy crewman Dory Miller grabbed an anti-aircraft gunner and blasted dive-bombing Japanese out of the sky, and six years after Jackie Robinson disrupted baseball with his Negro League panache. In a French film called The Road to Happiness, Armstrong and his all-stars blew with their usual pizzazz. The set is made up to look like a street lined with bars and clubs. The word Armstrong blinks from a marquee in the background as the band assembles and quickly starts to play. Meanwhile, vocalist Velma Middleton convorts among them with a baby carriage. The performance is at once rollicking and polished, with Armstrong's trademark trumpeting inducing in listeners an insistent urge to strut. Middleton's charms are evident, but she never opens her mouth to sing, thus becoming a dark body whose purpose is purely ornamental. Although one could imagine her as a proxy for Lil Hardin, Armstrong's first wife, and more important, the composer of the song. Watching the scene puts me at ease, as if my relatives at the family reunion suddenly sprang from their picnic blankets and revealed themselves as musical geniuses. Still, it's impossible to dismiss the band's mugging and what we might call extreme grinning, especially on the part of Armstrong and bassist Arvell Shaw, radiating an unlikely exuberance that recalls the ruby-lipped caricatures on the sheet music of Darktown Strutter's Ball. They stretch their faces to such an extent that it becomes difficult to distinguish a grin from a grimace. Are they mugging to make their brilliance more acceptable? Or could they simply be caught up in the ecstasy of making art? Their elastic expressions raise the specter of a judgmental audience lurking just beyond the frame. Unlike my experience, in, my experience watching Little Buck dance, I can't watch Armstrong strut without phantom viewers threatening my enjoyment. Little Buck gets to narrate his own story, although it tellingly ends in the museum where he has been alone the whole time. Our gaze supersedes that of the camera and perhaps even our double consciousness enabling us to consider for a moment that our interaction with Little Buck is unmediated. The noise of racially turbulent France fails to penetrate the museum's walls. Unlike Little Buck and Louis Armstrong, most of us can't trip the light fantastic or transform trumpet solos into miracles of sound and feeling. We are left to rely on others in the struggle to rouse our bodies and spirits into motion. When I stagger from my house, still groggy with sleep, I turn to the generous gods of bop and groove to help me get my hustle on. I pop my earbuds in, press play, and soon I'm walking down the street like Bernie Casey and I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna get you sucker. My theme music guiding my feet. My playlist is subject to the twists and turns of my fickle taste, but some tunes never lose their favorite status. Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. Grooveyard by the Montgomery Brothers, Strutton by the World Saxophone Quartet, The In Crowd by the Ramsey Lewis Trio, The Sidewinder by Lee Morgan, Giant Steps by John Coltrane, Soulful Strut by Young Hope Unlimited. My playlist propels me through public spaces where my presence might be questioned or challenged. One August morning, I was walking with earbuds firmly in place when someone called out to me. I turned and saw a white cop standing in the middle of the street, the sun glinting off his mirrored sunglasses. You doing laps, he asked. I told him I was. Which lap is this? My second, I replied. He gave me a thumbs up. I nodded, unsmiling, and went on my way. I couldn't tell if he was just being friendly or letting me know that I was under surveillance. To ease my troubled mind, I pumped up the volume. I might even cautiously assert that I began to strut. In my case, that means walking with an exaggerated rhythm and rolling my shoulders as if they're too muscular for my clothing to contain. A misguided idea of masculine motion that I picked up during my impressionable youth. Most people who come from where I'm from refer to it as a pimp stroll, 
a nod to its preeminence in popular 70s films like The Mac and Hell Up in Harlem. Although I'm pretty sure Zora Neale Hurston was describing the same action when she wrote about slick New Yorkers percolating down the avenue in 1942. I've seen brothers in Baltimore and St. Louis rock their wheelchairs with a similar gangster lean, thereby converting the pimp stroll to a pimp roll. You don't have to be a man to strut, although the typical heterosexual male imagination usually mistakes any other version for a favorable response to catcalling, a hip-swinging invitation to take things to the next level. Freed from the default gaze, strutting is more likely to reflect the enchanting intelligence of human beings who know their power and maybe even revel in it. Janelle Monet walking a tightrope while big boy chants encouragement, strut. Ava DuVernay headed to the set of Selma, strut. Valerie Jarrett strolling through the West Wing, strut. Sometimes we strut to reassure ourselves that we belong, that we have a right to the air we breathe and the space we occupy. At other times, we strut as if we could take back everything that has been lost. During a concert performance by New Orleans piano master Ellis Marsalis, four of his sons, and bassist Roland Guerin, the players seem intent on reclaiming the decorum forbidden to Armstrong. As strutting with some barbecue begins, Branford Marsalis beams affectionately at his siblings. There is some moderate toe tapping, knee bending, and gentle head nodding as the sextet methodically slays the song. But anything close to a smile is rare, and there is certainly nothing like the broad grins of Armstrong and Arvell Shaw. Their serious demeanor conveys confidence in their ability to let the music speak for itself. The audience yells enthusiastically, but their gaze pales in importance to, to that of the benevolent yet exacting patriarch, overseeing his son's artistry from his perch at the keyboard. Watching a clip of the performance, I think of Strivers Row, the talented tenth, new Negroes sharing their work in a Harlem brownstone. I resist the urge to visualize the musicians playing the tune at their own backyard cookout dressed in jeans and sneakers while dinner sweats on the grill. It's perhaps a testament to their uncanny gifts that they manage to strut while mostly standing still. Their ability to translate the raucous funk of Storyville while wearing neckties and stiff collars also testifies to the flexibility of strut, the way its boundaries shimmer and stretch. Offering further proof, Shelton Brooks has said he composed Darktown Strutter's Ball with denizens of the urban underworld in mind. According to him, the city's pimps and prostitutes held an annual event in which they discarded garb associated with their profession and dressed more like, well, an affluent jazz sextet. And even in the splendor of a concert hall, we understand that strutting with some barbecue doesn't mean taking a walk with a pulled pork sandwich. Cab Calloway, keeper of the book of Jive, defined barbecue as a girlfriend a beauty. The song's insinuation is closer to the musings of the eminent philosopher John Lee Hooker. Boom, 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 he sings. Yeah, 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 I love to see you strut. Profane or proper, haughty or naughty, strutting can be roomy enough to accommodate a low-down, foot-stomping blues and the dignified signifying of the Marcellus fam. I wonder what songs would have been on Elizabeth Eckford's playlist. In 1957, four years after Armstrong and his All-Stars released Stratton, and decades before iPods, Eckford found herself walking alone to Little Rock Central High. Separated from the eight other black students who would join her in integrating the school, she was forced to maneuver through a crowd of furious white women and men. They spat poisonous curses at her with all the enthusiasm of monkeys hurling feces at gawking humans. One could say those rabbit Arkansans were in a prison of their own making, trapped in a destructive mythology, prevented from exercising their full humanity. One could almost pity them, if not for the impact of their psychosis on the black people then living in Little Rock. They could not sleep, eat, learn, or walk according to their own desires. I've long been intrigued by the famous photograph of Eckford strutting carefully through that corridor of shrieking flesh, her expression stoic, her books held close to her chest, her eyes hidden behind dark glasses. I'm amazed that she stayed on her feet, reached her destination with no bop or groove, 
to drown out that loathsome chorus. In contrast to Little Rock, it was mostly men who pushed and shoved a young black woman named Shia N. Wanguma at a Louisville Trump rally in Kentucky in May 2016. Video footage shows her assailants jostling her and cursing her while Trump hollers, get out from the podium. Like the predators of Little Rock, the feverish Kentuckians can barely restrain themselves in their eagerness to inflict harm on a black woman's body. In both incidents, nearly 60 years apart, a black woman walked a solitary path with her life in danger. Her own deportment, a dramatic contrast to the uncivilized pack yelping and snarling around her. This is called strutting while holding body and soul together. Richard Wright successfully argued that the Negro was America's metaphor. Let us extend that notion to the situations Eckford and Nwanguma found themselves in. Their opponents, drunk on unfair advantage and absurdly imbalanced numbers, challenged their freedom to occupy, manipulate, and move through space. Indeed, their ability to take an independent step in any direction. On a larger scale, our former captors, similarly advantaged, frequently make a sport of denying us our basic human rights. When not pursuing physical punishment via overzealous policing, disparate sentencing, and mass incarceration, they debate our capabilities and subject us to their taxonomical impulses. Eckford's struggle to get to school leads me to envision black bodies moving through time, unhindered by desperate talk of bell curves, crime genes, fast twitch muscle fibers, and cultures of poverty. In such visions, I seek shelter from a white majority apparently inclined to limit us to a few options, glued to a slide like a lab specimen, working tirelessly on its behalf, comforting it with entertainment, caged up, silenced, or absent. While the narrowness of white desire can sometimes threaten to render our genuine selves invisible in an Ellisonian sense, it is also true that perceived blackness is never unseen. The imagined black presence boosts our population to impossible percentages while placing us at sites of white dysfunction where we haven't deigned to tread. From Charles Stewart to Susan Smith to Scott Latin to Paul LePage, white people falsely implicating phantom black perps is a durable American tradition. Perhaps the only thing that can challenge white fragility more than mythical fearsome Negroes is the disturbing sight of living, breathing black people gathering in one place by the thousands, their feet pounding the earth like those notorious drums. A. Philip Randolph's threat to organize a nationwide march of Negroes in 1941 was enough to frighten President Franklin Delano Roosevelt into integrating the defense industries during World War II. The implications of the 1963 March on Washington depended on one's perspective. With around 250,000 black people and their allies strutting through the nation's capital, it was either a dream realized or a nightmare come to life. Like the NAACP's silent march of 1917, it managed to sway the consciences of some white people while inflaming the hatred of others. It's no stretch to draw a dotted line from that march to the bombing of Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church later that year. While Washington had been the ultimate march by any measure, few of any observers thought it would be the last. Three months after Stokely Carmichael yelled black power during James Meredith's march against fear from Memphis to Jackson, Mississippi, activists in Chicago took to the streets in nearby Cicero, Illinois. The suburb's infamous reputation had been cemented in 1951 when 6,000 whites violently attacked a single black family, preventing them from moving in. On May 25, 1966, four bat-wielding white youths upheld community values by bludgeoning James Huey to death. A 17-year-old black college student, Huey had gone to Cicero to apply for a job. He was on his way home when the thugs jumped him near the bus stop. The sting of Huey's death was still lingering on September 4th, when the Congress of Racial Equality led 200 marchers into Cicero to protest segregated housing. 3,000 white hecklers were waiting to greet them. Go back to the jungle, they yelled, while calling them niggers, black bastards, and other choice epithets. No one was seriously hurt, the Chicago Tribune reported, 
although there were several skirmishes. Cicero residents hurled bricks, bottles, and firecrackers. Some marchers picked them up and hurled them back. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't participate in the march, but spoke to a student group in Chicago that evening. Some astronauts walked in outer space, and you can't walk the streets of Cicero, he said. By then, the civil rights leader had already learned that strutting could be as risky in the so-called liberal north as it was in the stubborn south. In Cicero, Little Rock, and other hotbeds of manic segregation, racial wilding was often the province of civilians, unlettered white men and unfulfilled white housewives acting out their frustrations. In the 21st century, when strutting where one chooses is still seen as intolerable black impudence, police officers become gun-wielding surrogates. Licensed to kill, they can exercise collective white hysteria by inflicting violence on our dark skin. In addition to satisfying a psychological urge, policing of the black body performs a critical economic function by supplying the nation's need for cheap, captive labor and fodder for the prison industrial complex. For these and other reasons, African Americans move through space fully aware of this fact. Police officers break the black body with the reliable blessing of the state. Since Darren Wilson's killing of Mike Brown removed any doubt that an objectionable strut is grounds for murder, Black Lives Matter activists have marched in the path of their predecessors, challenging the popular compulsion to crush and consume blackness. Still, the best service they contribute may be their expressed willingness to question the sanity of returning again and again to request protection and justice from a government that will not save us. The question reflects a perspective older than the Republic, offered by Thomas Paine long ago. Common sense will tell us that the power which hath endeavored to subdue us is of all others the most improper to defend us. The bloodthirsty impulse, the desire to see the dark body suffer, shared by many of those who benefit from unfair advantage based on skin color, may prove impossible to rehabilitate a prospect that many of us are reluctant to acknowledge or confront. In 1975, I was wowed by the whiz. There was much to admire in the brilliant, all-black reimagining of L. Frank Baum's classic. My favorite characters had no memorable lines, no crowd-pleasing solos. Instead of Dorothy, say, or the Scarecrow, I was drawn to the road. In Jeffrey Holder's Broadway staging, the famous yellow brick road was embodied by a quartet of golden, nappy-headed brothers who escorted the main characters on their journey to Oz. George Faison's Tony Award-winning choreography combined the exuberance of the cakewalk with the flashy footwork of the Jackson 5 performance, which the four dancers executed while maneuvering walking sticks more than six feet high. In the big screen version of The Wiz produced three years later, Director Sidney Lamette replaced the silent dancers with 26 miles of vinyl flooring. The film's disappointing box office receipts can't be blamed on that single change, but it sure sapped the joy out of it for me. I think I found the road dancers appealing because they reminded me of those smooth operators who bopped through our St. Louis neighborhood in big apple caps, bell bottoms, and platform shoes. They looked as if they leaped out of those men's fashion ads in the back of Ebony magazine. I thought men who looked like that were the epitome of cool, free-range strutters whose knack for swagger extended beyond the block. Elegant and powerful, they were high-stepping, hip-dipping masters of the slide, the glide, and the insouciant saunter. I imagined they could go anywhere, even to the white side of town, and return with their black bodies intact. It was a fantasy, I realized, similar to the collective African-American dream that will someday go from trotting James Weldon Johnson's stony road to easing on down it. It's a vision of a free black future that keeps us on our feet. Bodies in motion, we strut, despite the persistent riddle of history hard at our heels. We strut toward a future that is neither clear nor promised. We strut with consummate style. We strut with surpassing grace. We strut, therefore. Thank you.
me saying thank you, I mean, I don't even know, I think that's inadequate, but thank you. Um, you gave us so many images um, to think about and uh, some extra ones came to mind and I wanna know what is your response to them. So I was um, thinking about the switch, which has been kind of um, aroused violence, particularly in black communities, the switch. Oh, okay. And not the switch, but the switch as in. Um, and then I was also thinking about what you have to say about stepping, Greek fraternities, um, which has also become kind of like the object of emulation. Uh, so what would you say to the switch and to stepping? So tell me exactly what you mean by the switch. By the switch. Um, so the way in which you defined st struck was kind of like this notion of masculinity. Uh -huh. And so it seemed like the switch would kind of be the opposite oh. or has some similarities or some dissimilarities yeah. with, with, with the struck. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, uh. strut and um, uh, I mean the switch and stepping. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, one quick, quick anecdote about the switch. Um, and the switch is sort of a, a hip, how would you say, sort of a hip popping, almost flamboyant kind of strut that really involves the hip is, is mostly associated with women and gay men, right? Is that accurate? Uh, I, I use the word switch in one of my fiction projects and the editor Martin said, don't you mean swish? Mm. Yes, no, swish is actually a phrase that we use in, in the African-American community. I, I, I see it as a, a form of sort of uh, demonstrated um, nonconformism as well, you know, depending on who the user is. But it's, it's sort of using the body to kind of push back against rigid constraints or, or inhibitions that may be imposed upon it. Uh, and certainly could fit within a, a longer discussion of strutting, I think. Um, and uh, stepping is is fascinating, um, and you know it's it can it can be traced. You know, I've, I've, you've probably seen these pieces on social media that show African tribes uh, doing certain choreographed movements, and then showing, say, a black fraternity, a sorority, doing essentially uh, the same thing. And I, I think it is a very enduring, and durable tradition um, of black assertion within these contexts that, that we're discussing. It is really fascinating the extent to which it's now being emulated and become sort of a mainstream fascination what the last 20, 30 years. I mean, I remember going to step shows when I was in college 30 years ago and they were intensely segregated. You know, so it is kind of fascinating to see um, the way that's, that's changing and to what extent it will always be seen or not seen as an African-American tradition. Hi, um, I thought it was Hi. great. Um, I don't know quite what my question is, but uh, when I heard you reading your essay, it kept on making me think about the Starbucks controversy in Philly, and I was just curious about your thoughts around that sort of black belonging and sort of public spaces and the yeah. ability to strut. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, one of the challenges of, of writing a book, you're working on the manuscript, and you've got all these examples, but even as you're talking to your editor, there's going to be so many new examples before the book. That's part of the frustration, right? Because there'll be a new one by the time we get home from, from this event, right? So I, I, so I think it's just confirmation of uh, the consistent challenge of black bodies in spaces. I mean, it happens daily, and I think one of the differences is I saw, I saw a piece uh, sort of beseeching the larger community to, to say, 
uh, when will you start believing these stories? Because you know, we always have these stories, and these stories are very old. I reminded a colleague of mine, we worked together <coughs> maybe about 15 years ago, he was white, and we went to one store at lunchtime on our, on our break, and he wanted to go to another store, and I said, I'm not going in there because I got bags from this store. You know, I can't do it. You know, and he said, that's really silly. You know, you're, you're being really silly. I said, I'll meet you back at the office, because you know, he, he didn't understand it. So, you know, I've been thinking about him in these recent moments saying, I, sh I should send him a note saying, so this is what I was talking about. You know, but it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. Jabari, I'm so glad I came over from Emerson to hear you. Uh -huh. This is great. Jabari runs uh, so many things so well at Emerson, but we don't always get to hear his own creative work. Thank so um, I, I wondered if you had seen, or anyone here had seen, an article in the New England Quarterly a couple of, in the last year or two about, uh, it was looking at um, ads placed in newspapers for runaway slaves in this vicinity. So it was probably late 18th century. And there was an analysis of the language used to describe the movements of, of these escaped slaves and particular terms that kept recurring. And I think maybe Strutt was one of them. Um, and if you'd like, I can look for this if I nobody else knows. I would love to see it. I'm, I'm not knows, familiar with it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. um, it, I think it would help. No, that would be great. You know. I would love yeah. to see it. Hey there, how are you? Thank you for the, I got here late, but I really enjoyed the uh, series of images and the juxtapositions um, and the rhythms and the, and the prose too, which is so evocative. And, and uh, it led me to think about sound, actually. Um, it's easy when we talk about culture to continually lapse into the visual as a sort of like primary frame. And of course, when we're talking about race, it seems to dwell primarily in the visual domain. But I find myself just asking um, <clears throat> how we can locate these things in the sonic too. And mm -hmm. for example, what does strutting sound like? Mm -hmm. And even just more generally, if you ever find yourself uh, with more of a close attention to the sonic dimension of these things, um, the, to these phenomena that you're tracing. Uh, you know, even the, the way you described ensembles as, I think the phrase you used, correct me if I'm wrong, was casually slaying or something like that? Yeah. Is this what, um, methodically slaying. Methodically yeah. slaying, yeah. yeah. So uh, is that a reference to the sonic or to the visual? And, and, and just, I wonder if you could push on, sure. particularly on the sonic dimension, because music often travels without the visual, or at least it did in the 20th century, yeah. as a primary mode of circulation. So yeah, yeah. yeah and, and certainly, uh, you know, I'm describing uh, Armstrong playing uh, Strutting with some Barbecue. I'm actually watching a visual clip of it, which certainly influences my perception. If I just hear the record, I don't even have to think about that gaze as much that I'm imagining, you know, because I'm seeing him grinning, I'm wondering who else is watching. All of these psychological complications uh, impose themselves on my perception of what he's doing. Uh, that doesn't take place when it's strictly audio for me. Um, and one of the things that strikes me, so I, I, in the piece I try to talk about like the, the cadence of the soldiers and glory, and, and, and that's, very, that's very audible, but the the, uh, the march in 1917, all you hear is, is the drums. You don't hear the feet, right? And so I do think, um, you know, I've, I've given some thought to that. Like I talk a little bit about the cakewalk in there. And so the, the, the stepping within a cakewalk became more emphatic in places where they were forbidden to use any percussion. So they, they compensated with feet, hands, bones, spoon, what, whatever. So um, I try to think about that. I try to think about the sonic layer uh, that accompanies it. Um, in fact, that's something I would encourage, you know, um, to kind of look at it that way. So I'm always thinking about that and trying to incorporate that. And also the challenge of writing it is describing something I'm looking at that the reader may not see. So I, I feel like I have to you know, try to invoke both senses as I write about it. Do, do white people have a strut? Do blacks strut change as they move from, you know, let's say, uh, 
for example. My grandparents grew up in a very small town in Georgia, so now, and then they moved to Cleveland, and then now successive generations have been upwardly mobile. Has our strut changed? Is it the same? Um, is it learned? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and alternatively, is there a op is that so the is there um, not an opposite but is there a comparable strut that 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 whites have or other racial groups might have that they also learn yeah. that's passed on or different over generations or, or across gender or class lines like the white yeah. is there a white working class strut that's yeah. you know yeah I don't know well I, yeah I mean there's a lot of work to be done there. But on my, my very casual observation, the, the white strut, both working class and affluent, is a strut of affirmation, whereas the black strut tends to be a strut of resistance. We're kind of pushing back against what's being imposed on us. There's this more of a confirmation of this is my space. It belongs to me, right? And we're kind of pushing back against that, saying we belong in this space, too. I believe that everybody has a strut. There are different kinds of struts. Like one of the, one of the things I talk about is the way the black heterosexual male gaze sees the female strut. We, we tend to sexualize it regardless of what the context is. So, you know, we're, we're kind of perceiving it that way. But it could mean something entirely different, which I tried to describe with Valerie Jarrett and Ava DuVernay. So I do think there are variations of strut. Um, and like one of the things I talked about, uh, Zora Neale Hurston talks about strutting in the 1920s. Sounds a lot like the same strutting I saw in the 1970s. So maybe it did change in some ways over time, but I do think there's some commonalities that persist. Just to, um, yeah. just to follow up, I know that there's the, um, they do these blind screen tests where all you see, you can't tell the person's race, you only see them walking, mm -hmm. and people are very capable of discerning the race mm -hmm. from the walk. I believe it. So I think that, I mean, that, I think that, I mean, in order to discern race, you have to just not just know if someone's black or not, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I think there is, there are differences. Yeah. That, I mean, there has been research to demonstrate that even without, it's also like um, there's research that people can discern from the voice. Mm -hmm. over, so they know over the phone if someone's black or not. Um, yeah. yeah. Without any visual cues, which may yeah. go to the question of the auditory or the, yeah. the you know, is there something without any visual at all that can help. Yeah, so. and uh, also to your point, you know, there, there are definitely instances in which we are repressing the strut. You know, I mean, that's one of the questions I asked earlier. When am I repressing my own strut? When I'm policing my own body in these spaces because I've been conditioned to not want to disturb, disrupt, frighten, you know, so, so there's that aspect that I've written about that. I, I call it discrete citizenship, where you just kind of want to move through a space and not assert yourself, but also not, not be bothered, right? Not be noticed one, one way or the other. And I do see black people inhabiting that kind. It's not an anti-strut, but it's something different. And I, I do see it in other spaces. I'm, I'm aware that I'm doing it. I might see you doing it, whereas we both might relax in a different context, right, and not do it. I'm still mulling over this idea of the strut, and thank you, um, by the way, for a wonderful presentation. And wondering if in your mind, you've talked a lot about sort of the, 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 the cultural nodes and representations of the, the strut, mm -hmm. um, and positioned them primarily externally and within a public uh, context, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you connected it to one public context that I'm curious about how you see that evolution within social movements and where you have images of marches, which you just so wonderfully um, nuanced in terms of black bodies and representation in the public sphere and, you know, the, 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 the terror and the fear and anxiety that that inflicts on the white gaze, right, in, in, in a particular public way, and the performance of the strut as resistance and crafted and performed and ritualized in a particular way to deploy resistance um, and identity in the public sphere. 
And then secondly, I think of private internal struts um, that are endemic within African American and other cultures. But in this context, I think of stepping, which accompanies um, the oral, the sonic, the sensorial, all of that is mixed up in that. Um, I think of the ushers in congregations oh, yeah. who strut and yeah. who uses the body in particular modes in ways that's also strutting in a, in a, in a kind of sense. Um, so I am, I'm curious about your linkages and connecting all of these beautiful dimensions of the idea of strutting. Yeah, I don't know what I can say on top of that other than that it's, it's just something I pay attention to and I'm trying to, to make those connections between those different kinds of motions. Uh, and like, for example, I love to watch um, the, the, uh, the marching bands from historically black colleges and universities. All their videos are on, on YouTube and the internet now. And you, you do get to see some remarkable struts, sometimes with instruments, sometimes not. And I'm always interested in those kind of contrasts and similarities. Uh, for example, my siblings went to um, the all black high school in the neighborhood where I grew up. I was bused, so I went to a white high school on the other side of town. And graduation at the black high school, you know, the, the graduates walked in in pairs, but they walked in a very choreographed kind of step all the way to the stage. Whereas my high school, you know, we just kind of, <laughs> it was very different, let's put it that way. And it just wasn't as jubilant, you know? And, and, and I always had this envy of my brothers and sisters because they get to really, you know, they, they strut out, they strut out with their diplomas. And so it's just a cultural difference, but uh, yeah, I'm fascinated, just, you know, I want to continue to observe these kinds of motions in, the, in society and see what I can come up with. Yeah. And just, and just to the yeah. point of my sister over here in mm. terms of switching and the yeah. gender dimension, I'm also yeah. thinking, and you touched on the sexualized yeah. gaze of, of, of black men, which I think in, in part, I'm not sure it totalizes, but I go yeah. with you there in terms of, you know, gender dimensions. Yeah. But the real significations of, of women in particular, black women, deploying the liberty of black women's bodies or even now queer and non-gender conforming yeah. bodies in a way that is very much resistance, it's very much um, an agentic move towards taking up a lot of space, right? Yeah, in yeah, in yeah. ways that are not only sexualized, but also, you know, very culturally liberating. And, and assertive, right? Sort of asserting. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. I'm, I'm particularly, I mean, this is fascinating. Uh, yeah. But you, you presented strut as a form of resistance, mm -hmm. as a, if you like, a symbolic reflection of resistance. But there are different traditions in the resistance movement. Yeah. And I'm interested whether they have different types of struts. So, I mean, when I looked at movies, for instance, they often depict the nation of Islam mm -hmm. as reflecting a set of displays that are slightly different from other elements of the civil rights movement. Yeah. Is that true? Is there, is there a different form of depiction? And is that intentional or not? Is that, does it happen automatically? Uh, I ask that, I'll, I'll give you an ask, uh, in, in the South African context, in the resistance community, there was a, there wasn't a strut, if you like, mm -hmm. but there was a shake, a handshake. Mm. And when you shook the hands of a, a comrade, somebody who was this thing, you did it in a particular way. But in the Pan-Africanist movement, that handshake was different from when the handshake was in the, yeah. uh, in the, in the Congress movement. Right. And so the question I have, are there different struts within the resistance community, and are those intentional, or they just by default, in a sense? Um, or sometimes they just emerge organically. Like, if we look at James Meredith's march against fear, we could probably trace a change in strut right then, because we're, we're kind of going away from uh, civil disobedience, marching with our Bibles, to marching with our fists in the air. So, you know, it, inevitably that strut's gonna be different. Uh, whether it's intentional, I don't know. I, I think it can emerge organically. And then some of the other struts, like the Nation of Islam strut, for example, I think it looks different because of the uniform. 
but it's it's so similar to most of the other struts that I've seen. They just happen to be dressed differently. I, I would I would say it doesn't look like a distinctive strut to me, but certainly. Um, there's a difference between uh, the civil disobedience marches and then the black power marches. I would say the strut is, is, is wider, more aggressive, less shoulder to shoulder. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.